Carl DeMaio versus Scott Peters. It's one of the most watched congressional races in the country. You've heard their ads, now see them face to face. 10 News anchor Steve Atkinson asks the tough questions. 10 News presents the 52nd Congressional District Debate, brought to you by Alvarado Hospital. Hello and welcome. Congressman Scott Peters and Carl DeMaio are ready to debate the issues. They will be asked questions from our panelists. LaDonna Harvey from Kogo Radio is here, along with former Mayor Jerry Sanders, who is the president and CEO of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, our partners in this debate. Now, first, we have opening statements. A coin toss determined that Carl DeMaio would go first. And Carl, you have one minute with your opening statement starting right now. Thank you so much, Steve. And this is such an important election. I'm running for Congress because I believe we need a new direction in Washington, focusing on fixing our nation's financial challenges, getting people back to work by creating quality jobs, and by holding Congress accountable, making sure that Congress lives under the same laws as the rest of us with no special privileges, no special exemptions. In the last debate, Scott Peters denied taking perks that many members of Congress and many politicians have voted themselves over the years. And I think that this is a fundamental issue in this campaign. While our political leaders give themselves benefits, they take away important programs from us. In that debate, Mr. Peters claimed that he never took $69,334 in car allowance payments at taxpayer expense. Scott, here are the city financial records showing that you cashed $69,334 in car allowance payments in six years. Can you explain the comments that you made at the last debate denying this fact? Mr. Peters, you have one minute now. Is that the opening statement? That's the opening statement. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Uh, you know, I ran for Congress in 2011 when uh, Congress had hit a low point. Uh, the Tea Party wave had hit. Uh, Congress couldn't agree on a budget, and they waited so long to pay our national debts uh, that our credit got downgraded as a nation for the first time ever. To me, that was unacceptable. I ran on the concept of no budget, no pay. The idea is that if Congress doesn't do its job and pass a budget, they don't get their paychecks. We passed that law in Congress. We passed the first budget out of Congress in two years, and we stopped government shutdowns. Um, and we've made a lot of progress for San Diego. I've taken a problem-solving approach there. We passed a law to lower the, the cost of student loans. We passed a law to allow s small businesses to compete for federal contracts. We brought over hundreds of millions of dollars to San Diego for infrastructure and for jobs. Uh, and we've um, started the Military Transition Support Project, which is a, which is a nation-leading program to match uh, veterans with community support for jobs, job skills training, and personal counseling. And uh, with your support, I'll continue to work for our Congress that America deserve, deserves. Mr. Mr. Peters, thank you. Your time is up. Okay, here are the rules. The first candidate to receive a question from our panelists gets one minute to answer. The second candidate then gets a 30-second response, and the first candidate then gets a 30-second rebuttal. LaDonna has our first question, and it goes to Scott Peters. Uh, Scott, ISIS is a growing threat, as, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you're aware, and San Diego is currently ranked fourth on the terrorist watch list when it comes to known or suspected terrorists. So what do you do to make sure that more of those Homeland Security funds come here to protect this border or this area? One minute. Well, that's an excellent question. There's more. Uh, it, this is a very, very serious threat. I mean, these are people that are uh, even much more uh, dangerous, lethal, and strategic than the folks who um, took down our buildings and killed so many thousands of Americans. Uh, I believe in a multi-strategy approach, but starting in Iraq with a government that, that is stable and political, because we can't do that for themselves. We can't, we, we can't do that for them. They have to have a st stable government. We need allies in the region, uh, those countries in the region who are concerned, they need to contribute. We need international allies uh, around the world who are as, as worried about terrorism as America is. And I think ground strikes was the, the appropriate approach. And then ground troops, not American ground troops, but training troops on the ground to be able to deal with that threat. And then we have to budget correctly for, um, for, for developing those threats here. But I think the appropriate strategy is to start there and make sure that it doesn't, uh, doesn't travel. The other thing I'd say is that uh, Juan Vargas and I dropped a bill that would give the Secretary of State the ability to revoke uh, passports of people who go over there to fight for ISIS. Those people should be uh, treated as, as, uh, as though they committed treason. Mr. Peter, so I'm going to have to cut you off there. Mr. DeMaio, you have 30 seconds. Well, San Diego is a military town, and we know firsthand that ISIS is a major national security threat. And when we send our service members overseas, we have to back them up with a credible, effective plan. Mr. Peters has been on record saying that he supports the president's approach. And yet people such as former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, even former President Jimmy Carter, have said that Mr. Obama's plan is insufficient. 
When you're the left of Jimmy Carter, Mr. Peters, you're out of step with San Diego. Mr. Peters, 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Well, what I think you heard Mr. DeMaio say, it says that he doesn't support the plan of our commanders. Uh, he's got his own band of, uh, of retired uh, military, uh, but I've listened very hard to the commanders. We, we took a lot of briefings about exactly how to deal with this threat, and I think the steps we've taken are appropriate. Any further involvement would require additional congressional action, but I do support the steps that our commanders have recommended and that Congress and the President have worked on together. Okay, our next question comes from Jerry Sanders. It will be for Carl DeMaio, and you will have one minute to answer. Mr. Sanders. San Diego is the home to uh, three major industry clusters, uh, the defense, tourism, and the innovation economy. Uh, these are known as the traded economies. What, have, what, policies, what policies have you supported uh, to ensure that these industries thrive? We have to get an uh, economic approach in this country that really restores the American dream. Uh, I started my company right out of college from scratch. Uh, I had student loans that I was paying off, uh, and I had to figure out how to make a small business succeed. Twenty years later, the opportunities that were available to me are not available to the next generation. I'm fighting to make this economy revitalized again, to create middle class jobs. We have to reform our tax system so people pay a fair share that we buy down the rates by closing the inappropriate loopholes that big corporations have been able to get that Mr. Peters has supported. Second, we have to cut red tape on small businesses by making government mandates easier to comply with. And third, we have to improve K through 12 education so we have a workforce that has the skills necessary to get 21st century jobs. For the clusters that you just mentioned, science, technology, engineering, and math, so important for the high tech, biotech, and the advanced uh, 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 engineering issues that we're trying to tackle in our engine in our defense sector all these things are part of my economic program to revitalize jobs in San Diego mr. Peters back to you sure well I'll address the the question on the three traded economies I, obviously I joined the Armed Services Committee because not only is San Diego a partner in our national defense but we want to make sure we get the, the economic benefit out of that as well it's about a quarter of our jobs but I've really been a, a committed advocate for National Institutes of Health funding, which, by the way, has created the two treatments for Ebola right up there on the, the Mesa because we've been giving scientists grants to solve these problems. I'm also an opponent of the medical device tax, which I believe have, should be repealed, and I've voted against that. And I'm a supporter of mobile technology as a way to provide health care, even through cell phone technology, that will uh, provide better care at lower prices. Mr. DeMaio, 30 seconds. Again, you know, this is really about restoring our middle class. Uh, Mr. Peters, uh, in 2010, backed the largest tax increase in the history of San Diego. And it wouldn't hurt big business, no. It was a sales tax. It would hurt the working poor and the middle class and small businesses. I stood up to Mr. Peters' plan, and San Diegans overwhelmingly supported uh, a, a rejection of that tax increase. And then I went on to author the Small Business Regulatory Relief Plan, and we got bipartisan approval for my proposal to cut red tape on the city's business improvement districts. I'm running on a record of results of helping create jobs, cut red tape, and move our economy forward. Gentlemen, thank you. Back to our panelists now and to LaDonna Harvey for our third question for Scott Peters. Well, Scott, you mentioned <coughs> Ebola. That's mm -hmm. another threat, of course, that I think many Americans are worried about. ZMAP is the drug that you were talking mm -hmm. about, an experimental drug that was developed here with a company based in San Diego. Um, it's government funding, though, that really funded that and other experimental drugs for sicknesses like Ebola. So how do you keep those government dollars flowing when it really matters? Well, it needs to be a priority. And I have been a, I actually won an award from something called the California Healthcare Institute for my advocacy of funding for the National Institutes of Health. You know, I, I went to the Salk Institute a while back, and I got a briefing from some of the top scientists in the country who happen to be working here in San Diego on projects like Ebola. And they told me it takes until you're about 40 years old to get the lab where you can compete for the grant um, that, um, and, and even in the good times, about 25% of those grants uh, were funded. So even you know, in good times, it was a 75% failure rate. Well, today, because we haven't kept up with funding, uh, only about 7% of those grants get funded. At the same time that other countries are investing, China, Singapore, Brazil, uh, England, Israel, and young scientists are thinking, is this really the place where we can do our science. We're going to lose our lead in science if we don't invest. We have to make that a priority. It's something I've committed to, my opponent won't commit to, uh, but it's also very important for the San Diego economy because each one of those labs is a small business uh, supporting jobs here in San Diego. Mr. DeMaio, 30 seconds. Well, I agree with Scott. We do need to support our long-term research and development programs as well as private sector uh, solutions, uh, biotech solutions, and that will help us address some of these diseases. But Scott, 
This is a crisis today. We're talking in the next 72 hours, the next week, where this could get completely out of control. That's where we need effective leaders in Congress who are going to stand up, speak out, and ask tough questions. I do not believe that this administration has formulated an effective policy for dealing with the Ebola outbreak. I believe that many members of Congress have been silent on this, waiting, doing a wait and see attitude. San Diegans, Americans deserve more. We have to be looking at changing flights, uh, better monitoring by CDC, Mr. DeMaio, better controls. I'm going to have to cut you off there. Your time is up. Mr. Peters, back to you for 30 seconds. Well, we need a three-part uh, approach to dealing with Ebola. We need to make sure we prevent people from getting on the planes who have Ebola. We want to make sure that we care for them when we're here. And we have to develop a long-term solution. Uh, we can't be reacting. Uh, we should be reacting, of course, to each crisis. But we have to be prepared. And that's, that's the importance of long-term investment, which the Tea Party has gotten in the way of. These across-the-board cuts that the Tea Party imposed on us in 2011 have really uh, put, a, put a, a large obstacle in our way. So we, we do need better protocols. And we need to do more uh, to make sure that people uh, in West Africa aren't getting on planes, but we do need a long-term strategy as well. Okay, back to our panel once again, and a question from Jerry Sanders. This one will first go to Mr. DeMaio. Polls, polls show voter confidence in Congress is extremely low. Do you think the polarization of Congress is getting better or worse? And what would you do or what have you done to, comb to combat that polarization? This is one of the most important issues in this campaign. Uh, I think Polls show that we have low confidence in Congress because Congress isn't doing its job. It's not working on the issues that matter to the American people. They're fighting amongst themselves rather than fixing problems. Mr. Peters has said something quite remarkable in his opening statement. He said that when he was elected to Congress, he passed no budget, no pay. And because of that, he ended government shutdowns. Scott, on your watch, there was a very big government shutdown. It was the wrong thing to do. And the reason why that shutdown occurred is because you supported a bill that was called no budget, no pay, but in fact allowed members of Congress to continue to receive pay and to be reimbursed for pay even though they shut down the government. We all know that the budget analyst said that the government shutdown cost more than keeping the government open. That's why people can't stand Congress. And instead of getting their jobs done, instead of being held accountable, instead of living under the same laws as the rest of us, they are completely unaccountable. They give themselves perks and privileges while leaving problems for the rest of us. Congressman, 30 seconds for your response. I was an ardent opponent of the government shutdown. Mr. DeMaio knows that very, very well. Uh, he did not speak out. It was his, his party, who, the Republican Party, who shut this down because they were trying to repeal the health care law. It was after we reopened the government that we passed the budget and we stopped government shutdowns. I hope we won't have another one, but it won't be because I, be because I supported it. Look, I've been the fourth most independent Democrat in Congress. I've been someone who's walking the walk of working across the aisle. I'm the, one of five Democrats supported by the United States Chamber of Commerce because they say me, a Democrat, is someone who can help job creation. It's that kind of bipartisanship that's going to break this gridlock. Back to you, Mr. DeMaio, 30 seconds. Again, you can't say that you're for no budget, no pay when you support a bill that allows members of Congress to continue to get paid and get reimbursed for their paid even though they miss their budget deadline time and time again, and they shut down the government. This is Washington doublespeak for you. You got a politician who says they've done something, when in fact, when you take a look at the details, it's smoke and mirrors. It's time for honest leadership. It's time for real results. And in Washington, I believe that we can have people, if they're held accountable for results, come together and do the right thing. Starting with no budget, no pay for real, that would be a great foundation for dealing with these budget issues and bringing people together. Gentlemen, thank you. And we're going to have more of this debate right after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to our congressional debate. The next question is from LaDonna Harvey to Scott Peters. You know, sometimes you have to duke it out and sometimes you have to reach consensus. So give one solid example from public service when you've been able to bring those two opposing sides together to make an important deal. One minute, Mr. Peters. Well, everyone knows what a mess the Veterans Administration has been. And we heard that from Phoenix. Now, San Diego hasn't seen a lot of that, but everyone in Congress also knew we had to act. Um, I worked, uh, and there was a big gulf between Democrats who, who seemed to think it was about money and Republicans who think, seemed to think it was about um, blame. Uh, and it was a little bit about both. We need a culture change in the, in the Veterans Administration, but we also are gonna, we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that because so many people are returning, we need more money. But people can come together. I look for a point of agreement. I made a motion on something that's, that seemed uh, like it wasn't the biggest issue, but it was providing um, in-state tuition for veterans on the GI Bill for, for them to go to college or, or to get educations. And it was very, very hard for Republicans to vote against that when we put that on the floor because everyone agreed on it. And so the national press gave my motion credit for being the catalyst 
for getting people to come together and really come to an agreement that's going to start to solve the, the Veterans Administration problem with a new secretary and a culture change and also with the funding that's going to have to help us deal with a lot of these uh, challenges we're going to have from these big numbers of, uh, of vets coming home. Mr. DeMaio, 30 seconds for your response. Well, an area where I'm very passionate about is open government, making sure that the public has a right to know what's going on inside government and to be part of the process. Right when I was elected to the city council, I reached across party lines to partner with Donna Fry, a Democrat. And working with her, we were able to enact important reforms to open up the city council docket and process uh, to more deliberation uh, and involvement by the public. Then, in 2012, the city council unanimously came together to pass my sunshine law for San Diego, putting a wide array of government records online so the public could search and see all financials and contracts to know where their money is going. Mr. DeMaio, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Your time is up. Mr. Peters, 30 seconds for rebuttal. I'm sure the best indicator of who's able to work across the aisle is, is who's supporting us. Donna Fry is supporting me, by the way. But um, if you look, I have the traditional Democratic constituencies from, uh, from labor, uh, the, all the environmental groups who saw Mr. DeMaio with the worst grades in the city council, Planned Parenthood, but also a lot of groups that are traditionally or often Republican. Police and fire are supporting me, as are firefighters. Uh, as are dentists, doctors, most of the recent chairs of the, of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, and as I mentioned, one of five Democrats uh, supported by the U.S. Chamber, that's working across the aisle. Okay, back to our panel and our question from Jerry Sanders for Carl DeMaio. Phoenix and Salt Lake City have both solved the issue of chronic veteran homelessness. What will you do to ensure that San Diego gets its fair share of funding to do the same? Uh, this is an issue that's very near to me uh, because when I was orphaned at 13, my brother, sister, and I were split up. My sister actually lived on the streets out of her car uh, in the first month of her trimester of, of pregnancy uh, for three months. Not knowing where my sister was, uh, I was very worried for her. And so when you think about this for veterans and for the general population, we must do more to deal with the issue of homelessness. It's a major issue not only for these individuals, but for many of our neighborhoods, such as Pacific Beach, downtown, throughout our city. Uh, I'm committed to continuing the leadership I started on the city council of collaborative, bipartisan efforts on homelessness. I was part of a city council that helped site the first one-stop center downtown to deal with ending the cycle of homelessness amongst, amongst uh, that, that population, plus citing the Aspire Center, which deals with mental health and uh, post-traumatic stress uh, counseling and services for our veterans. I'm absolutely committed, and I will be an advocate in Washington on this very important issue that's personal to me. Mr. Peters, 30 seconds from you. Well, I feel a lot better about that if Carl DeMaio hadn't voted against every one of the four budgets uh, that Mayor Sanders proposed when he was on the city council. Now he claims credit for the things that other people accomplished, even though he voted against them. Now, the fact is that uh, we have the third largest population of homeless veterans and the largest population, of, uh, uh, the whole large population of homeless veterans, the third largest population of, vet, of homeless. I've been working with the downtown partnership to, to make sure that we get our fair share of federal funding. Uh, I've been working, I have a bill to shelter homeless veterans. And as I mentioned before, we've started the military transition support project to provide jobs, job skills, training, and personal counseling to veterans, to keep them on their feet and off the streets. Mr. DeMaio, back to you for 30 seconds. Scott, the record is clear. Each of those projects, the downtown homeless uh, shelter, the One Stop Center, which is an innovative uh, program from across the country, uh, the Aspire Center in Old Town for our veterans, I voted for each and every one of them, and I was an integral part of trying to build a consensus and constituencies to support those projects. More importantly, you were part of the city council that could never seem to get the winter shelter done on time. And so the winter shelter would go weeks, if not months, late, uh, putting in jeopardy the homeless uh, population during the winter months. My city council that I participated in on a bipartisan basis got on schedule for those winter shelters. All right, now rapid fire questions. Each of our candidates will have 30 seconds to respond to this. Uh, no response, that is, from the other candidate. No rebuttal. We alternate who goes first. We'll start with Scott Peters. The first rapid fire question on the issue of high speed rails. Do you want it here in California, and how would you fund it, or would you rather see that money going towards the roadway infrastructure? Mr. Peters? I voted against the current funding for the current project as it's configured today. I believe in the statewide rail modernization for transportation, for job creation, and for the environment. But the problem with this plan, the $68 billion plan, nothing for San Diego to Los Angeles, which is the busiest quarter, passenger rail quarter, outside of Boston and Washington, D.C. We only need about three to five billion to provide the best quality rail service in that quarter, but until we have that, I'm not going to be able to support it. Mr. DeMaio, same question. You have 30 seconds. 
It's a flawed project, uh, uh, only sustained by billions of dollars in our tax money. Uh, those dollars should go to other transportation priorities. And what we should do with our high-speed high rail program in California is take a page from Florida, which has a very innovative public-private partnership uh, that will allow us to get rail at a far better price in the areas where we actually need it for economic growth. Uh, but this is a state, this is a nation that has neglected its infrastructure. And Mr. Peters, while on council, you raided our infrastructure funds, leaving us with potholes and storm drains and water pipes that were bursting. All right, second rapid fire question, be back to you, Mr. DeMaio. How do you balance secure borders with immigration reform? You have 30 seconds. Well, it's, I don't necessarily think it's a balancing act. I think it's a foundational act. We have to secure the border first. There are reforms to make in immigration in terms of visas, the process, to make it streamlined and strategic, to hold people accountable. But if you don't secure the border, then we will always have an immigration crisis in this country. Mr. Peters had a chance to vote on a very reasonable bill just two months ago. But under pressure from the House Democratic leadership, he bent and voted against that important bill that would allow Border Patrol the tools they need to secure the border and deal with the immigration refugee crisis that we see today. Congressman, 30 seconds. Oh, well, I'm one of the most independent lawmakers in Congress. I don't bow to pressure to Mr. DeMaio. The problem with that bill is that it was far inferior to the comprehensive approach that the Senate, uh, the Senate adopted with 69 votes, Republicans and Democrats, that secured the border, yes, but also dealt with those labor shortage issues that are hurting San Diego so much. In the innovation economy, Qualcomm, solar turbines, they need high-skilled labor, they need immigration reform. We're educating uh, some of the smartest people in the world at the best universities in the world, and we kick them out so they could start their jobs someplace else. That makes no sense. The Senate bill would solve those problems. We just need a vote in the House, but your Tea Party won't let it happen. Mr. Peters, we're going to go with you again as we alternate. Uh, this next question, do you want a national policy on marijuana? Why or why not? No, I believe that each state should be able to decide what it wants to do about marijuana itself. We may have a very different view in California, from Colorado, from Alabama. What I believe the federal government should do is allow each state to make that decision. So change the federal law so that if a state wants to, le state wants to legalize it, the state can be permitted to do that. If the state wants to legalize it for medical purposes, as California has, uh, the state should be allowed to do that too. The federal government should not get in the way of the states making these decisions uh, on the legalization uh, or the criminalization of marijuana. Same question for you, Mr. DeMaio, 30 seconds. You know, I'm taking on my own party on these social issues. I think that we ought to get politicians out of our private lives, allow people to make decisions for their health care, uh, who they want to love in terms of marriage, and of course, uh, when it comes to medical marijuana, respect the votes of the state of California and many other states to deal with this in a different way. Uh, I have already announced I would support legislation to decriminalize and get the federal enforcement actions out of states where they have decided uh, to, to implement, as California has, a medical marijuana ordinance. Uh, we should allow people to exercise personal freedoms and get out of their private lives. Mr. DeMaio, thank you. I'm going to have to cut you off there. Okay, now to the closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute, starting with Scott Peters. One minute, sir. Mr. Uh, DeMaio has made an issue of, of uh, perks in this, in this election, and he's only told you half the story. What he doesn't tell you with no budget, no pay, is that when the Tea Party shut the government down, hit the people supporting him, I didn't take my salary. I gave it all back to, to, uh, to veterans and seniors who were affected by those cuts. When the Tea Party sequestered with these 8% across the board uh, cuts, I cut my own pay by 8% and gave it to charity. I've turned down the federal pension. I've turned down the, the federal health care. I've given every cent of my city pension back to libraries. And the thing you just said about my car allowance was remarkable because he uh, put this in, this is a part of his positive campaign for Congress. He put this in his mailer. He, sh he showed you the half of this that shows the, the compensation I took, but he doesn't show you that I, I refused to take almost $140,000 of my salary as a c city council member. Now, uh, and I did pass no budget, no pay, and we got the first budget that will shut government shutdowns. We'll stop government shutdowns. Uh, San Diego's deserve better from their Congress members than folks who would tell half the truth. We have tough issues. We need serious problems. We, we have serious problems. We need serious people to solve them. I'll be honest with you and continue to Congressman, work for Congressman, I'm going to have to cut you deserve. off right there. Mr. DeMaio, you now have one minute. You're right, Scott. San Diegans deserve the truth. They also de deserve elected officials who are acting with integrity and will do the right thing when no one's looking. Mr. Peters, you're worth over $100 million, according to your own financial statements. And in the middle of the city's financial crisis, 
you voted for a 42% increase in politician salaries. Didn't you take spiked it. your own pension. Didn't take you it. then took your pension early on December 3rd, 2008. Gave the it same back. day. Mr. Peters, please. The same day that I led by example by turning down the car allowance, cutting my own compensation 22%. No one asked me to do it. I gave up the pension, a half a million dollars of lifelong payments. The same day that you enrolled early in your pension system, even though you're worth $100 million. Now, while you were taking these perks, what did you do when no one was looking? You cut services and left problems to us. The only time that you started doing all these things is when people started calling you out. Mr. Peters, integrity is doing the right thing when no one's looking. It's because you owe a debt of gratitude Mr. DeMaio, and to your constituents Mr. to do DeMaio, the right I'm thing. I'm going to have to cut you off there. Unfortunately, we're just getting fired up, and the debate is over at this point. That's all the time we have. Don't forget, Election Day is November the 4th. You can get all your political news on 10news.com. In the meantime, thanks for watching.